It is good to see everyone here uh, tonight. Good to have our visitors. We welcome you. Glad that you're with us. One of the distinguishing features of Churches of Christ, when people who are not members visit with us from time to time, is the fact of we the fact that we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Usually one of the very first things they notice is we do not use instrumental music in worship. Very distinguishing feature of purely vocal congregational music. The next thing they notice as they visit with us from Sunday to Sunday is the frequency by which we take the Lord's Supper. That is done every first day of the week. The question is why? You might think, well, that's a strange question. Why ask why concerning the frequency? Why we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday, every first day of the week? Well, we, we know that we are told to be reminded of certain things that we're aware of. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter says, I'm going to stir up your minds by way of reminder. So some of these things that we just need to be reminded of uh, from time to time. The fact of the matter is, there is not a direct statement or a command in the New Testament that tells us, take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Because of that, some people have concluded that we can take the Lord's Supper whenever we choose, at any time we choose. But we're going to answer the question tonight, why? Why we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial of his death. Memorials are very important to us as humans. They help us to remember things of the past, significant events of the past. And Jesus gave the Lord's Supper as a memorial to the greatest event in the past, his death upon the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is writing to the Lord's church at Corinth, and he says in verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Jesus took elements from the Passover feast, and from those elements he instituted the Lord's Supper. He took bread, unleavened bread. And he said in verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So the unleavened bread that was taken out of the Passover, he placed it into this memorial supper in which he says, this is my body, unleavened, sinless, that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He took the fruit of the vine that was also used in the Passover and says this represents the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So that fruit of the vine represents the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary on the cross. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Notice the phrase, as often as. That denotes a frequency. A pattern of taking the Lord's Supper. So we know there was a regularity to it. A regular partaking of the Lord's Supper. To remember his death. To remember his body. To remember that blood that was shed on our behalf. But the question is, how often? How often? We look at the practices of men and we see various answers. In the churches of men, in the denominational world, you have various answers as to how often that is to be done. You can't see this very good, but this is from the Great Oaks Community Church, which is a denomination, and it says down here in this paragraph concerning the Lord's Supper, we celebrate the Lord's Supper approximately once each month. 
And that is pretty much the norm that you find in the churches of men. Once a month. Usually the first Sunday of the month is when that is partaken of. So you have this from this website concerning how often they partake of the Lord's Supper. This is from another website, the uh, Bear Lake Christian Church. It says on their website, Communion Sunday. We take communion on the second Sunday of each month. So again, once a month, they particularly do it on the second Sunday. Here, again, you can't see it real good. The print's is small, but it is a Presbyterian church. And here is a schedule of the communion services. And it usually falls on certain holidays. Again, not 50 time, 52 times a year, but on certain Sundays and certain uh, religious holidays that, uh, that they deem uh, worthy of the Lord's Supper. So, that is a communion schedule. This is from the Myrtle Grove United uh, Methodist Church. And on their calendar, the first Sunday is designated Communion Sunday. But the rest of the Sundays, there's no communion. None whatsoever. The first Sunday of the month is when they do it. And so here's the regularity that you see, the common practice on the frequency of taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, among the churches of men, once every quarter, uh, some even once a year, others uh, most likely you find uh, once a month. Now, a few have it offered every Sunday, but no obligation. They might have it every Sunday, but you're not obligated to observe it every Sunday. And so that's the very common practice of men. And what you find in our area is, is most likely just done once a month. And so here is the answer from the churches of men and the practice of men concerning how often you take the Lord's Supper. But it's very interesting that these same churches on the first day of the week pass the plate for money. In fact, sometimes they will pass the plate on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and if they have a midweek Wednesday night service, they'll pass the plate on Wednesday night too. But yet they'll take the Lord's Supper only once a month. It kind of indicates where the priority is. Let's see what the biblical evidence is concerning the frequency of taking the Lord's Supper. As has already been stated, uh, you do not find a direct statement or a direct command that says, take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. But we know from logic and a proper reasoning with the Word of God that we don't have to have a statement like that. We don't have to have a statement that says that for the Bible to teach us how often we are to have the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 and verse 7. I want you to look at this passage here. In Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> the book of Acts is divine history as Luke by inspiration is writing about uh, the early church, the church beginning in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 6, as Luke is writing this, and Luke was with them, so he knows for sure, he's using the pronoun we there. Acts 20 and verse 6, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now notice that they stayed seven days because of a particular event that was going to happen on the first day of the week. Verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So you see, they waited seven days there so they could meet with the church in Troas. And something significant happened on the first day of the week. The first day of the week, the disciples gathered together to break bread. Now, there is a significance to that phrase, break bread, as we will see later on in our lesson. The breaking of bread here has reference to the Lord's Supper. And it was something that was done upon the first day of the week. 
And we're going to see later on why this is a pattern or a tradition that we are to follow. The breaking of bread in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 refers to the Lord's Supper. Now there are occasions where the breaking of bread can refer to a common meal. But let's look at the evidence in the Word of God concerning how the Bible uses this phrase, the breaking of bread. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26, Mark 14, 22, and Luke 22 and verse 19, you have the institution of the Lord's Supper. Christ is taking, as I said earlier, elements from the Passover, the unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, and it says he broke the bread and gave it to them. You see that phraseology there, the breaking of the bread. And in Acts chapter 2, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 2, which is the birthday of the church, you find in Acts chapter 2 this phrase that refers to the Lord's Supper. Acts 2 and verse 42, talking about the early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The breaking of bread that you find there in Acts 2 and verse 42 is talking about a specific act. It's talking about the Lord's Supper. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, we see this phrase in relationship to the Lord's Supper once again. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, Paul says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The bread that we break. So the breaking of bread is an expression that indicates the taking of the Lord's Supper. It's used to refer to a common meal once in Acts 2 and verse 46. Acts 2 and verse 46, we see the phrase referring to a common meal, and the context shows it's not talking about the Lord's Supper at all. In Acts 2 and verse 46, it's talking about a meal that's taken in nourishment. It says, so continue, continuing daily with one accord, talking about the church and the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So they continued daily... And they were breaking bread daily. Well, that breaking of bread is the taking in of a meal. They ate their food. And that indicates nourishment. Something that's not the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was not given to be nourishment. It was given to be a memorial. A memorial to the death of Christ. So Acts 2 and verse 46, you have the use in which it's used in a broad sense to refer to a common meal. But the rest of these passages refer very clearly to the Lord's Supper. The significance of that is this. In Acts 20 and verse 7, we have a worship assembly. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that no common meal in the worship assembly is to be partaken of. That was the problem in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11. They were turning the Lord's Supper into a common meal. They were abusing it. And Paul said, you're, you're not remembering the Lord's death. And that was the sin that they were committing. And so he wrote to them to correct that problem. So Acts 20 and verse 7 is talking about the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread. Let's look at further Bible evidence concerning this. The first day of the week is a day of significance. Why? The day of importance that we find on the first day of the week is because of this. Jesus was raised upon the first day of the week. He died on a Friday. He was in the tomb all day on the Sabbath, that Saturday. And upon the first day of the week, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, Luke chapter 16 and verse 9, the tomb was found empty. He was resurrected. So Christ was raised upon the first day of the week. Jesus appeared to his disciples upon the first day of the week. John chapter 20, verse 19, also verse 26. He made his appearance on that day. The church was established 
upon the first day of the week, as we will see a little bit further on. Acts 2 and verse 47. It was a day of worship for the church in the New Testament. Acts 2 and verse 42, it talks about the church worshiping together. The day the church was established, that was on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that Jewish feast day, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. The church was established when they were baptized and the church had its beginning. The day of Pentecost was on the first day of the week. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 15 and 16. It always fell on the day after the Sabbath. So the church worshipped. They partook of the breaking of bread upon the first day of the week. That's the day the church was established. We've already looked at Acts 20 and verse 7. That was a regular assembly of the church to partake of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1 and 2. We see that the collection is taken up upon the first day of the week. And we'll see the significance of that here in just a moment. The first day means every first day. And we see the significance of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Which says in these translations that are listed here, on the first day of every week, lay by in store. You give as the Lord has prospered you. So the collection was given upon the first day of the week. And we see also from Acts 20 and verse 7 that the Lord's Supper was taken on that very same day. So those specific acts of worship are only on the first day of the week. The Lord's Supper and giving. The significance of the Greek word kata there has a distributive force. Every first day it was a regular assembly of the church every first day of the week in which the Lord's Supper was uh, partaken of and the collection was taken. Now let's try to illustrate this in our common way of thinking. When someone says the club meets on Monday, that implies every Monday. When we say you will be paid on Friday, again, that implies on every Friday. Saturday is double time if you're working on Saturday. Again, logic tells you that implies every Saturday. And worship is on Sunday. And this is very significant. These churches that don't take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, when you're driving by their building, I want you to notice their sign. Their sign will say, Worship is on Sunday. You know what that implies? Every Sunday. But yet they didn't put that on their sign. It doesn't say worship on every Sunday. But they know that you understand when their sign says worship on Sunday, they're going to be there every Sunday. It's an understood every Sunday, even though they didn't use the word every. So that is just the common way that we speak. And that signifies that it was a weekly observance. You don't have to have the word every Sunday there in relationship to the Lord's Supper because it is implied. An implication is just as strong as a direct statement. When God gave feast days in the Old Testament, He specified what day He wanted them on. When it was annual... He gave the day of the year. When it was monthly, he gave the day of the month. And when it was weekly, he gave the day of the week. Look at this chart. God is very specific concerning these days. These are the Old Testament days of memorial and feast. For the Passover, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6, verse 14, verse 24. It's the 14th day of the first month annually every year. The Feast of Trumpets, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24. First day of the seventh month every year. Atonement, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 27. Tenth day of the seventh month every year. Tabernacles, 
Leviticus chapter 23, verses 39 through 44, the 15th day of the seventh month every year. Now, a weekly observance. The Sabbath day, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, the seventh day of the week, that was every week. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And that happened every week. And when we come into the New Testament, we have the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse 7, upon the first day of the week, and every week has a first day. It doesn't take a PhD to understand that. That's very simple. So we see here when God gave a memorial or a feast that he specified when it was to be done, the time, and that gave the frequency. Why would he not do that for the greatest feast of all, the memorial to the death of his son? Is he going to leave us in the dark concerning when we are to partake of it and leave it to our own devices to come up with the frequency? No. It is implied. It's parallel to the Sabbath in this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. This indicates every Sabbath day that comes around there to remember. You remember the Sabbath day. Well, how many? Every time there's a Sabbath day. He didn't have to say remember every Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is implied because every week had a last day of the week and that was the Sabbath for the Jews. In the same way, logic dictates Every time the first day occurs, that's when the church assembles together to break bread. To break bread. And as a result of that, we see clearly the frequency of taking the Lord's Supper. These come around every week. It did so for the Sabbath for the Jews, and it does so for the Christian upon the first day of the week. And every week has a first day. We are to keep the traditions that we find in the Bible. This is what we're commanded to do, to keep tradition, the tradition that God has given to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Tradition. You keep those traditions, Paul says. You stand fast and hold to those traditions. And you withdraw from those who don't keep those traditions. The weekly observance of the Lord's Supper it's part of that tradition. And therefore we're commanded to observe it. Not to modify it. Not to change it. But we are to simply observe it. Let's look at further evidence. And then the lesson will be yours. John Calvin, who was one of the founders of the Presbyterian Church, in his book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, Volume 6, Chapter 18, Section 56, said this, Every week the table of the Lord should have been spread for the assemblies and the promise declared by which in partaking of it we might be spiritually fed. Well, here we have John Calvin saying every week you partake of the Lord's Supper. However, some of those churches uh, that are, are derived from his teaching and hold to some of his teaching do not do it every first day of the week. Here is a Lutheran historian in uh, Church History, Volume 1, page 332, concerning the practice of the early church. He said, The Lord's Supper was still a part of the divine worship every Sunday. The whole church partook after the amens of the preceding prayers. The deacons carried the bread and wine to everyone present realizing that the word wine there is used in its ancient sense of being just simply the fruit of the vine and nothing intoxicated. So he is saying, look, here was the practice of the ancient church, the divine worship every Sunday. They partook of the Lord's Supper. 
So here again is another denominational historian saying this is what happened in the early church. This was their common practice. This is an interesting quote that I came across just this afternoon. It says, so with the Lord's Supper, my witness is, and I think I speak the mind of many of God's people now present, that coming as some of us do weekly to the Lord's table, we do not find the breaking of bread to have lost its significance. It is always fresh to us. Now he's saying here, as we come to the Lord's Supper, it's a weekly activity, and it's always fresh to us. It does not lose its significance. One of the arguments that's made in the denominational world about having the weekly Lord's Supper is, it just becomes too common. You do it every week, it just becomes common. And it, it doesn't have the significance as it had. However, when they give, every time they assemble, that doesn't seem to lose its significance. They're going to get that money. No significance lost there. But when it comes to the Lord's Supper, they'll only do it once a week. But he says, As some of us do, we do this weekly. And it has not lost its significance. It's always fresh to us. Shame on the Christian church that she should put it off to once a month and mar the first day of the week by depriving it of its glory in the meeting together for fellowship and the breaking of bread and showing forth the death of Christ till he come. This is Charles Spurgeon, a Baptist preacher of the 1800s, preached this sermon July 28, 1867. Shame on those, he says, who just take it once a month. That's a common practice in the Baptist church now. It's very interesting when you study uh, the, the teachings of Charles Spurgeon, not only did he do this, he opposed instrumental music in worship. The, the church, the Baptist church that he preached for in London in the 1800s bore a striking resemblance to churches of Christ more so than a modern day Baptist church. However, he is making it very clear that shame should be on those who just do it once a month. And I would have to agree. We have seen the pattern. We have seen the tradition that it is a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me as often as, how often? Every first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. Let's just leave it alone. Let's don't try to modify it. Let's don't offer it on Saturday like some of our liberal brethren are starting to do to accommodate the world. Shame on them. Let's leave God's will alone. And remember the death of our blessed Lord, His body, His blood, every first day of the week. Perhaps there is someone here tonight who needs to obey the gospel needs to partake of the great offering that Christ made upon the cross. Believe in Him. Confess your faith that He is the Son of God. Repent of all your sins and be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and the Lord will add you to His church. If you've done that, you've gone astray. We urge you to repent and come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sit.